Okay, we're recording. Matt Goss, how are you doing? I'm really good. How are you, mate? Yeah, not not too bad. Not too bad. It's nice to hear an accent that sounds very similar to mine. And, uh, I know. Where, where are you from, by the way? Uh, Essex. Essex. Essex uh, boy. Mm. Well, I left my giant. I've got a bit of a black eye and I'm not, I'm like, you know, I tried to cover it on Good Morning Britain the other day and I wore some glasses and stuff and I looked like I had a green face. So... Um, <laughs> So I'm, I just, I'm, I'm embracing it. Oh, if anyone can pull off a shiner, mate, you, you're doing a stellar job there. Thank you, mate. <laughs> well, Matt, before we get on to the, the playlist, I just, you know, we're looking that the remainder of this year is going to be a far more connected and, and positive uh, and exciting place than maybe the first half of this year. And so just looking back over the last 16, 17 months, how have you found you know, the situation that we've all been sort of thrust upon, uh, had thrust upon us. How have you found it both personally and creatively? I think without question, I I think we've all been forced into a place of self-reflection. And I, and I think um, it's been great at times and it's also been extremely troubling at times because, you know, we, we crack on with our lives at such a pace that we kind of we we do not look left and right sometimes at things that possibly are distressing to us or disturbing to us and doing four or five shows a week here for 10 years you know in america and it got to a point where i i was i felt like i was abusing my body my, my you know my life i didn't have a it was just all about entertainment and making sure people felt you know transported and I really wasn't really addressing some of the things within my own life and I I realized that this this issue of mental health and and everything became very very deeply important to me and it's my French bulldog Reggie there he is <laughs> um, that's why I, he's not he's not literally not messed up one um <laughs> interview of he's literally not one but, um but I, I feel I felt very connected to the way people were feeling. And I, I realized that when I was doing my Instagram lives, that I actually didn't know my fans. You know what I mean? After 30 years, I've, I've been singing to them and I had a sense of who they were. But then we got into, you know, who they were and, and some of the troubles they were going through. And then people that were not my fans started to come into my space. And that's when I also started my own podcast and, it was, it, I, I completely detached myself from music. I had no interest in making music again. I had no interest in singing again. Um, so it, it was quite an extraordinary thing. Ironically, the connection that I found talking about much deeper issues was the reason that I actually ended up wanting to make a new record and, and realizing there were indeed people that wanted me to keep going and because when you're in one place and you're singing in one venue, although it be Caesar's Palace, the most famous casino on the planet, um, it's a very isolated place to be when you're driving home at night. You can't expect people to be excited about what you do every day. And I would, you know, the person I'd always call would be my mum, you know, mm. and she's she's up there. So you you sometimes you desperately need to have a conversation about what you've just done and but you can't enforce that on other people and expect them to care as much as your, your family would. Um, but, but a long-winded answer, but I think that really it's been, it's been a, a period of growth. And for some people, some people have, have elevated and some people have regressed. And I think all of us have cut away some of the fat, you know, I mean, I've definitely let some people, you know, drift off peacefully and, and just realize that, that, that we, neither one of us serve each other. And you know, I've just, you know, with hopefully not too much resistance. Absolutely. I think, <clears throat> I think so, many, so many people have, you know, used this time where the, the, the breaks have been, you know, put upon us anyway, uh, to, to use that time to just reflect and, 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 and assess things. And, you know, from such an awful situation that we've all been, you know, involved with, hopefully we will all come out of that, you know, with a little bit more of the fat trimmed off, you know, and, and, and be happier and more positive people from that. Couldn't, couldn't, Agree more with you um, on, on what you just said there, Matt. Um, I'm going to start the playlist now, uh, and I always start uh, with the song 
that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please? Mm. You know what? You're going to have to help me because I don't have the list. That's of fine. Mine. That's fine. Um, so you went for the who, mm-hmm. and uh, I won't be fooled again. When I, whenever I hear this intro, I, I don't think there's ever been a time I've heard this intro where I haven't got goosebumps. Yeah. Um, I do think they are one of the greatest rock, rock and roll bands in music history. One of the most authentic bands. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a great conversation with Roger Daltrey. He gave me some insight about things that I will never repeat, but it was an <laughs> incredible, incredible conversation, incredible human, just a humble, loving person that just has this kind of Peter Pan kind of rock and roll energy. He's just an incredible person. But I always find that when I meet the people that, 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 I, I, and that I love their music I just it goes to a whole different kind of stratospheric kind of place where I'm just like yeah you know and when I hear this it's uh it is the personification of, of rock and roll when this moment comes on you you want it to go on five times longer than it does yeah but one intro so in regards to intros um over the the, the years that you've been um producing music um, you know, if we go way back and and and, and to you know to the, to the early years, um, and it was, uh, I guess we could you know, and I say with the greatest respect, like mainstream pop music. Um, I love pop music. It's, not, yeah. it's a great great word for me. Uh, and, and 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 I think back then the pop song was short, sharp, to the point. You know, hook lines, and then I mean, you've chose something like the Who there, and, and that's a, a very long intro. Um, and it's almost it's a bit proggy in places with the sort of arpeggio synth before the guitars drop in and things like that. And so, as you know, over the years, you know, that, that have followed, you know, the, the early music, we've seen the way that people also listen to music change dramatically. So, you know, from the days of buying CDs and vinyl and cassettes and stuff through to streaming services. And what I see now, and if I look at the way that my children get their music, they've got very fast thumbs that just seem to have yeah. very short, it feels like the attention spans are getting slightly shorter. And so with that in mind, I'm, I'm, it's a long winded question this Matt, but I just want to ask you if the way that, that people are listening to music and streaming and, and we're looking at music now seems that so many songs now are here on the radio start with a chorus now and it's, you know, they're quite short songs. Do any of these kind of movements and trends in music find their way into your songwriting process or are you still very much a traditional style songwriter of I write what feels right when it feels right? Do you get where I'm going long, with that question? Yeah, it's Sorry. Not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a long-winded question. It's every every syllable is necessary because it's everything you said is true. And the truth is back then you you were not writing music with the with the law that it has to be there's a kind of understanding that it has to be somewhere around 320 um right now and so in a way people don't people that aren't songwriters don't understand you have to condense a story into three minutes and 20 seconds is is an art form and you have to really really to try and tell a story and create an emotion in that short amount of time is very difficult but back then um it, it wasn't it, that wasn't the case i mean you would hear songs that were much longer and with much longer intros and and now people are like you got to get to the chorus within one minute yeah um which is to me it's quite horrific in some ways because um let's be honest you don't you know the freedom that a painter has uh is is limitless i mean you you would never say you've got to use fuchsia when a paint painter wants to use you know salmon you know it's 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 a small difference to some maybe but to a painter's eye it's it, it's it's life or death and i think that um i think it's important to to talk about what you're saying because the attention span has got extremely short um the way that music's delivered is different uh physical product was there was a sense of occasion with music when you went and bought a cd or, or i'll go back to a cassette or when you bought a vinyl and then it, and then the cd there was this there was this sense of occasion that you were going to buy a physical product and you were going to own it and you were going to look after it and read the liner notes of who played on the record who 
who's part of it? Where did you record it? And all these images would come into your mind and you would create this kind of story about how this record came about. And now it's a digital file. Um, at least now they've upgraded, started to upgrade the, the quality of the digital files, which is good news. But um, again, to answer your last part of your question, do, does it find its way into my songwriting? Absolutely it does. Um, this record I've just made, I would only listen to commercial music for six months. While I was making this, this record six to eight months, I would not listen to any of my influences because they're embedded in me. Stevie Wonder, you know, Donny Hathaway, you know, all these, these, you know, Duran Duran, all these bands I, and singers that I grew up listening to, they're embedded in me anyway. But um, I, they absolutely, absolutely did have an effect because I wanted to write a current record. Yeah. I didn't want to be out of the loop. And I also want to stand my ground with, you know, radio programmers and, and, and people like that, you know, so I can say I know exactly what I'm doing. It's not, it isn't rocket science. If you are a musician and you understand what you've got to do, you do have to study and you do have to stay current. And I think it's a healthy thing. Although I don't like certain elements of it, I think it's healthy to go along with it. And in regards to the word pop, you know, the Beatles were pop, the Who were pop, Rolling Stones were pop music back then, you know. So we have to be careful, I believe, how we use the word pop because we don't know, we don't quite know what we're listening to sometimes at that time. You and I both know we've heard a pop record 20 years ago that now has become a, a bit of a classic. Yeah. So we've got to be very careful, I think, the way we, how we receive pop music and and just allow it to breathe if the, if the Beatles were thrown onto the scrap heap because they were screamed at we would have lost some some of the most beautiful music on the planet of our time so just I, I like to be very mindful when I listen to music well I'm going to take you back for track two Matt and I'm going to ask you please to tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you and I can I can give you a nudge because you did just mention uh, Donny Hathaway yeah, I mean, there's something about this singer that knowing his personal story, knowing his, you know, just, just also knowing how much Stevie Wonder loved him. Mr. Donny Hathaway is, is a singer that to me just moves my heart and my soul. It doesn't matter if, what the song is. I just feel his true understanding and his authenticity of, of every note. And um, I covered this song on an acoustic guitar. Um, and it's this song is a song for you and it's uh the lyric in it as well the complete self-deprecating lyric that you know acknowledges that you've not been good to somebody and um talks about his mortality in the song and it's just extremely emotional to me um that can go for anything he says but this song in particular really moves my heart if you had to pinpoint what that emotion was what would it be matt Truth, truth, honesty. People, you know, you talk to mainstream media sometimes and you say things like, if you, if you undress your soul and so will the audience and you get this bullshit, you know, like, oh yeah, another analogy or whatever, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. If you've been on stage, if you do not, if you don't do undress your soul and just speak truthfully to an audience, you will not get the audience that you want. Yeah. And I think that you you have to dare, to, you know, the amount of times I've gone on stage and said, I've had a crap day today, it's going to be a good show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because if I've had a crap day and I'm in a bad mood sometimes, it will be, it's going to be a great show because, it you know, never waste good agony, you know, like go out there, but be honest with your audience. They deserve it. And, and more importantly, they can handle it. They can handle it. If you've uh, if you've had a you know you wake up and you're feeling low you're having a blue day, um, do you reach for Duran Duran or do you reach for for something somber? Do you just try and pull yourself out of it or do you process it and 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 put music on that you know is going to almost soundtrack you know feeling feeling a bit blue and 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 kind of just work your way through it by almost sort of giving that giving that emotion you know a uh, a, a musical cuddle for want of a, a terrible, you know, description. Well, 
No, I think that that feeling of many people will, will relate to the feeling. I think most of us just want to feel safe. Most of us just want to feel safe. Yeah. And and you get to a point in life where you just you you find a certain groove within yourself. And when you get to that place where you can be more emotionally intelligent and speak about emotions and you know even you just said emotional cuddle like you you like ter- you, you said it's terrible i don't think any form of language as long as it's colorful and it creates an image and there is analogies and similes and metaphors i'm all for it why do we want to dumb down the english language it's a beautiful yeah. language so um I- i'm all about emotional intelligence and the acknowledgement of what you're feeling when you're feeling it so a lot of musicians don't listen to music when when they're said because we want to get away from anything musical because it makes us think about i mean you hear every note and it's almost invasive music sometimes because you're surrounded by it and you're talking about it and you're on stage and you're creating it but i would say if i'm if i'm feeling sad if it's about my love life for example I, I don't, it's really hard for me to listen to sad songs because I, I hurt to, to, to an abyss, you know, I really do. And I love hard and I hurt hard. You know, I came out of a relationship in COVID that, and I really loved this woman, but it just, we couldn't find common ground now, you know, and it was just, it was time for me to accept uh, as that, that it was just, you know, we, we couldn't find common ground and um but i didn't i don't mind the pain that goes with that because you're meant to hurt you're meant to otherwise what's the point you yeah, know completely. and i think music music can heal and i will put on songs in the key of life or fulfilling his first finale or inner visions talking book you know i will put on stevie wonder and and just and he, he will always lift my spirits, always. I'm going to ask you for track three, Matt, to tell me the song uh, that reminds you of your time at school, please. Uh, without question, this, this band, just everything about this band, even now, I love, I love uh, the, I just love that they're still together. You know, when you see a band, after all these years, certainly when I've been in the industry three decades that they're still playing, it just gives you such a beautiful feeling. But when I was at school and I was wearing Stay Press and I was wearing Waffle Cardigans and Fred Perry's and Doc Mines uh, and, and and my loafers, my bowler hats, my trilbies, uh, the legendary specials. I mean, Ghost Town to me, again, incredible incredible piece of music but certainly if you again listen to the lyric and understand where that song came from and it was meant to be the death of scar you know and they're talking about all the clubs are being shut down and and there was too much violence around the music and um and ironically that song kind of you know kicked scar in its ass it was an amazing moment in music when you could start feeling you know that new romantic kind of wave coming in and which I also love, but Scar music to me will be with me for life, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's a, a, a sonically that record. It, it's just feels like it's just being beamed down from somewhere. It's I don't think it sounds like anything else the specials do. And I love the specials, but that song, uh, and, and I'm, I've got this thing where I think some bands have this one song that is, I'm not necessarily saying, necessarily saying better than the rest of their catalogue, but sounds completely different from anything they've ever done. Um, and I'll get on to that because another one of your picks today is one of those. But I think like Ghost Town, it's so eerie. And you know that once you've heard it a couple of times, you know that that euphoric bit is going to kick, you know, after yep. the second call. And it's just glorious. And, and just seeing, you know, Neville and, and Linville and the band just going crazy while slap bam in the middle is Terry all deadpan. Don't crack a smile. It's just yeah. what just one of the coolest bands to ever walk this planet. And yeah, absolutely incredible record. Um whilst we whilst we're back there at school, like how was that for you? Did you enjoy school? No, not at all. I, I hated school. 
I just because you know we moved like ten times, so we'd have to constantly go into another school and and uh, you know and there was never real there was never a real sense of uh, um, nothing was permanent. It was very transient and it was exhausting if I'm honest and a lot of fights a lot of you know stay in your territory as you do as kids and um just it was it was almost violent our schooling it was just uh but then I eventually found a drama teacher called Jane Roberts who is the reason why I think I'm doing what I'm doing she was she didn't care about the academic side of my 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 time at school although I loved Mr. Brooks um, and biology, and I had a massive crush on Miss Simkovich, who used to wear fishnets and play her accordion, which was extremely, <laughs> extremely out of order, really. I mean, with all our hormones going through the roof, you know, she'd sit on the on the counter with her legs crossed and her fishnets playing an accordion. I mean, outrageous. <laughs> and Mrs. Funnel actually as well, like she had, she used to wear fishnets as well. I think that's where my love of fishnets must stem from. I've just realised it with an epiphany. Have you got an unhealthy relationship with an accordion as well? <laughs> I don't know. I think is, there, is there such a thing as an unhealthy relationship with an accordion? I think whatever floats your boat, Stu. But, um, I think that, yeah, I, I think that I couldn't wait to get out of school. And I had my first band when I was 12. And I was, I was number one in 36 countries simultaneously when I was 18. So you know people ask me you know asked me recently what, what what was your what did you do during your clubbing days and i was like my, you know it was it was just we had a different up we had a different different start i guess but we me and my brother couldn't wait to get out of school um really so there was never any other career path other than i, I imagine at the time pop star well i was a i, I had a massive love of videl sassoon and I, I was obsessed with videl sassoon and the geometric carton and the impact that he had on fashion in the 60s. And I was lucky enough to meet Bidel Sassoon um, actually at an Elton Joint event in, in LA. And we chatted and I told him, because my mother was a hairdresser. And and the sound of scissors, even to this day, I'm getting a haircut today, even though what I've, what I've got left, but I'm, hang, I'm hanging in there, Stu. And, um, <clears throat> and we, you know, I just, I thought I wanted to be a hairdresser I wanted to be, but I wanted to, you know, wear the three piece suits and, and do it right and, and be part of pop culture. And then to be honest with you, I, I had a Saturday job, a hair salon and I, I was just washing hair and, and just, you know, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, you know, I, I, I romanticized Fidel Sassoon and that's where I thought I was going to go before that. I thought I was going to be a vet but I'm talking super young, but I, uh, I was going to be, ironically, I was going to be an actor. My brother went into that field, but, and then when I sang, um, cabaret, um, everybody seemed to like my voice and I didn't even know what that meant, yeah. but it just, um, then we had our first record deal offered to us when we were 16 by Arista. And the day of that we were meant to sign with Arista we was 16. They passed on us. <clears throat> we thought our life was over. We we're like, oh, it's done. Anyway, so, you know, a year later, we met Tom Watkins with the Pet Shop Boys. And a year after that, we were, as I said, all over the world, number one. But it was it was great because we just, sorry to, to go on, but we were in the restaurant. It's fascinating, and the, man. Fella, and the fella, the fella that actually was meant to sign us, the Arista, was in the same restaurant with us. And we were number one in Britain and the world at the time. And we walked up to him to say hello. We were excited to see him. He, he thought we were coming over to, to say, I told you. But we, we were just happy to see him. He went, I know, I know. And we're, no, 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 we're just happy to see you. And he was like, you know, but his, his response was, I know. But it was good. It was, like, it was one of those moments for a musician that, that, if I'm honest, was quite a nice moment, you know. Yeah. Well, for track four, I'm going to ask you to tell me the first record you remember buying um, from a record shop, please, Matt. <clears throat> And first record I, I remember buying from a record shop is again, I was asked recently my favorite, also another one of my favorite intros, and and I I described this as as the the most beautifully brutal use of a cowbell, mm. and um, just one of the most badass grooves 
ever. And this is Low Rider by War. What a tune that is. Why don't the cowbell get used more? It's every time I hear it in a song, I'm like, why does that not get used more? It's so effective. It is a tricky instrument. It's a tricky instrument because it's so dominant. Mm. It's so dominant. So you, you know, I think nowadays an analog instrument sticks out like a sore thumb on a beat because mm. now we're using big samples on, you know, the, the bottom end on records these days is through the roof. Um, you know, some of the bass, you know, I was in a studio in the record plant recently and I've been recording there for 25 years and they had some clients in there. Every single speaker in, in the record plant was blown. And I've been, I've never, ever experienced that. And, you know, you're looking at thousands, tens of thousands of dollars per unit. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, a cowbell, very, very dominant, yeah. um, simple instrument. But in this song in particular, it, it, I don't think this tune would exist without that. that that's yeah. the, you know, that, that instrument. I love it. One of my favorite songs of all time. Remember where you bought it? I was in Camberwell. I know where I bought it. I was in Camberwell. Um, and I was with my Aunt Sally. And, um, and I couldn't wait to get that 45, put it on. I still remember those days with such fondness. Camberwell to me is for that question where I felt the, the, the best times of my life. Yeah. I mean, you, you've mentioned like the Beatles and, 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 and bands like that and Stevie, like growing up, was it a musical household? Uh, without question, my God. 37 Crawford Road in Camberwell was a place that it, that you would either hear Frank Sinatra, Mel Torme, Stevie Wonder, um, Donny Hathaway, Ian Durian, um, uh, you'd hear Free, Cream, uh, just, it was just, an incredible array of music, but I mean all the time. And everyone was singing, everyone just, it was just full of music. It was just full of like energy, but it was, it was so many different genres. Was you a confident kid? Um, I don't know if I was, no, I don't know if I was. I think we were good kids. Yeah, I mean, we were rascals, me and my brother, we were double trouble, but, you know, having a twin, there's this kind of sense of, there is a sense of like, if you mess with me, you're messing with him kind of thing. So we sure. did, we did have that. You didn't, we were double trouble. I mean, we had that kind of energy about us. We really did. And, but uh, I think when you have come from a broken home, you do have that abandonment issue where you're terrified that your mum's going to walk out. And, and we did have that, you know, we did have that abandonment, abandonment, uh, issue where we where we worried that, that that was gonna gonna crumble our family was gonna crumble but <clears throat> apart from that we did have you know we were not wealthy on any level we were pr pretty poor i would say in some ways but we were rich in love my granddad my granddad was a gunner in the second world war and my nana died when she was 50 and my granddad never remarried but he came he, my granddad was a foreman a builder then he became a faith healer he became a healer and um and my granny ramson was a medium and so we had a lot of spirituality in our life as well we very kind of it was always encouraged you know to to look beyond what we know yeah, yeah. for track five matt i'm going to ask you to tell me a song that soundtrack your time clubbing it was this was where it was a difficult question for me because we didn't really go clubbing. We did do the Buffalo Boys scene at Astoria and, and stuff like that for a while. So and that was... can I ask you about that? Because it's it's something that I saw someone done a, a fashion show on that or, or like an art exhibition, sorry, on that um, about three years ago. And my <laughs> knowledge of it was very limited. Is this we're talking about? Lena Cherry's Buffalo Stance was in response to that. And are we talking about Jamie Jane Morgan and that stuff? Yeah, there was a whole scene like Steve Strange and yeah. and, and all these. It, it was, it's a difficult one to explain, but all I know is like, you, you, 
your bomber jackets and you had, his, you had all the all the patches and the badges and the, and that's really where the broth that came out of in a way like the mm. you know the denim the bomber jackets and the dot martins it was a whole whole thing and you you really could it was almost like the bomber jacket was the the modern day vespa yeah. it was like you just really were mindful what you put on it but people were just really receptive to just the way that you would make that that you know i guess also nick Kamen, you know mm. you know as well like you know that whole kind of era was was just incredibly uh exciting musically and it was go global it was you know the Astoria. it was that that was the scene for me i mean and so if i'm the the, the song you've chosen um but that was not part of that era that was not yeah. part of to me that that's i chose that song specifically because I felt that was one of the, to me, it was just that that was such an infectious loop. And I want to use that word. That was the, that was when loops were dominant in pop music. And certainly in, in that kind of club scene at the time that, you know, acid house and all that stuff were coming in. And, and that was when people, even the, even the general public started to understand what a loop was. Yeah. But to me, I still think it's one of the greatest uses of a loop and, um a record that conjures up such attitude and in just the it, it was just it just oozes attitude this does and and to me i may be wrong but to me it's a very very british british record and that's why i chose it because it made me that song always makes me want to move yeah i mean we should point out for listeners we're talking fool's gold by the roses and yeah like what? A, I mean, for me as well. I think in in eighty nine, it was such an interesting time for music as well. I think you know we'd started to see like you know house music happen. We'd started to see hip hop really explode like globally at this point. And you know you had like new waves of hip hop like De La Soul coming over. It was the second summer of love. Acid House, Soul to Soul. There were so many. Yeah things going on and then obviously in Manchester the Hacienda and you've got the Mondays and the Roses and Primal Scream and you've got all of these bands that are just cultivating this sound that just seem to soundtrack that second summer of love which was you know a term that the, the, the press obviously threw upon it but for me as a massive fan of Stone Roses I love everything they've done but Fool's Gold doesn't sound like anything else they've done Exactly right. And also another thing, what I'm realizing now, a lot of the songs I'm choosing, the bass heavy love, you know, you know, the bass line on that, you can't wait when that bass line comes in. Oh, I mean, ridiculous. It's just glorious, isn't it? It's like, and you, and it stays steady. Like, I think that's the thing as a musician where, because that loop is so rock steady, it's like, it's, it's straight yeah. ahead, does not, unashamedly doesn't change. But that yeah. bass line just sits on the back of it and just, what a tune. Definitely, definitely. Well, I, I spoke about confidence um, earlier, and Matt, you've chosen um, a, a career in in an industry that's probably a bit more competitive than hairdressing. You, you've chosen one of the most cutthroat businesses, and you've, you know, you, you, you've spoken many times about you know some of the the industry things that might not have been particularly fair on on on, on you and your brother as a young man, um, and you've kept going and, you know, new records are dropping now. Um, so aside from confidence, would you say you're driven? I would say to, in regards to confidence, I just want to clear that up. I am a very confident man. I'm very comfortable in my own skin. You know, you, what you see is what you get. I'm fearless in regards to interviews. And if an interview is an interview, then it's, it's I don't think they're doing their, their job. If it becomes a conversation, then they are. Yeah. And I think that, um, are we having an um, interview or are we having a conversation, Matt? I just want to know where I'm standing. <laughs> I could do this all day long, mate. I just, just yeah. good stuff. I could do this all day long, talk about music and listen to music. Um, Lovely. Uh, we are definitely going to have a beer when I get back. We've got to have good. a beer. Or five, five, probably at this point. Let's but, do um, that. No, it's, you know, I, I, you know I, you're right. You have to have very sharp teeth in this industry because you're swimming with sharks. But you've got to know when to use that bite and you know i've been through betrayal i'm still going through betrayal this this month there's still stuff i'm dealing with there's still people that 
come into your life that want to disrupt your space and it's out of greed usually in my in this industry but it's it, you just have to just stand your ground and know that um that this too shall pass it's just you, you know i've seen i've seen so many um bands and experiences and just come and go and and it really isn't about hit records it's about longevity that is success no matter what career you're in music or whatever you do if you're still doing what you love and you're still in whatever career you're in um that's that is that is the definition of success and i think that should settle people's minds and um i i feel i am driven i but i feel that it's not nothing is important to me nothing is more important to me than loyalty loyalty is freedom and i have a saying like you can be loyal in front of me and i'm grateful for that but having my back behind my back and me finding out that you had my back that is more important to me than than any hit record my bank statement anything to have people in your life that we can that you dread saying goodbye to one day um and having uh, i have a little tribe you know and we just love each other and we we look out for each other so for me that's the number one thing i am driven and i do want to prevail the, the documentary that we did after the screaming stops it was a cultural moment it would change the way the documentaries we made i think that it was so honest and brutally honest that i don't think people will approach the music documentary in the same way i think i'm proud of that i don't want to be a, you know terrified of saying what we've done and i i want to do, with what i'm doing now with this new record I don't want to make a pop record that's uh, that's good. I want to make a pop record that 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 blows blows people's minds. I've, and I know I've done that. And and I wouldn't want to be doing a promo circuit if I wasn't if I wasn't able to say that with absolute absolute complete confidence. Um, so yeah, I am driven and pridefully so, but not to the point where I'm oblivious to people's feelings or what's what's important, like like a good conversation with your mate and knowing that they know you're there for them and also knowing you've got that in return. Absolutely. I'm going to take you home for the next track, Matt, and I'm going to ask you uh, for a favourite song from an artist from your home country. You went to Liverpool for this one. I know, it's Strawberry Fields, right? You went to Rigby. Ellen Rigby, okay. Uh, you know, it was a tough one for me because to not include the Beatles in my life would be absurd. You know, there's right now, all I'm listening to is the Beatles right now. My, when I get in my car, I'm, I'm a big car guy. I love, I, I love getting in to my, my little vacuum and putting on my music. And all the only, all I'm listening to right now is the Beatles. And, and uh, there are so many, songs from the Beatles that you could choose and everyone says oh you know strawberry feels but I mean even that song I mean it just makes me so happy and I think about as a musician the choices that were made and the effect that record the effect that that record had hello sorry oh. call came in. and think about the effect that that record had um on on massive bands like the Beach Boys and and you know musicians scrap their album because of that album yeah um but when i hear eleanor rigby and i listen to the lyric and i listen to what george martin did to the strings i don't know if anyone's listened to the string only version of this song um i would highly recommend that you that you immediately download the string only version of eleanor rigby because it it, it just shows you you really was the fifth beatle it was it it's it's miraculous the use of counter melody. Yeah, the use of counter melody. It, it's it's almost inappropriate. It's it's two songs that just magically bond together, um, and I, I, I it just makes me feel so much. This song makes me feel so much lyrically, melodically, musically. I think it's one of the, one of the greatest songs of all time. I couldn't agree more with you. And I've got very limited memories of studying music at school, but we had to study that record and we had to pull that apart. And 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 I think that's the first time I read lyrics and something actually kind of went in. It wasn't just listening to the song and not really taking it in, but 
remember reading that and just thinking, oh, there's a, there's a story here. Oh my God, it's heartbreaking. And and like you say, the, the string arrangement on on Eleanor Rigby is oh, it's it's just it's just different level. And I talk about the Beatles, you know, quite regularly on on here because like any any artist you speak to, they're gonna have to at some point reference the Beatles because they're the Beatles. And it's when you look at when they started their career and when the Beatles split up. It's quite a short period of time. And then when you look at what happened within them years, how no. everything was a reinvention, every album, just a giant step. It was just incredible. Like, and yeah, I, I just I just think it's, you know, it, it doesn't need for me to say that they're one of the greatest bands ever. It, it's, it's a fact, isn't it? But yeah, just the, the, the fact that what they've done in such a short space of time is a thing that constantly amazes me. Yeah, and I think, again, just... When you listen to this record, you can literally l l left brain, right brain. You can listen to the song and listen to the, yeah. the string arrangement. Just as a musician and the understanding of counter melodies and and along with a very very distinct pop melody, it, it's just incredible how they managed to get these two to fuse together and make absolute sense it's impossible it's a movement you find your body moving with the strings you find your body moving with the with the melody of this song so yeah i mean true love true love for this song matt for the last record you get to play tastemaker and i'm going to ask you to tell me a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear can you remember what you sent over for this one <clears throat> I, I believe it's uh bloodstream by stateless mm. Thank you for that, by the way, because I've never heard that before. Oh, do you like it? Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's exactly, it's exactly what it is. It's painfully beautiful. And I think that the reason I love this song is because it rips me to shreds, literally, as simple as this song is in many ways. It rips me to shreds because, you know, you've got an into my bloodstream. And that one line is the only way you should love. And when you do make love to someone and you, you, you know there is an exchange there of gargantuan proportion, there's an exchange spiritually, biologically, emotionally. Um, and those are sometimes the things that you have to leave behind. Um, and this song just rips, rips me to shreds. I think it's beautiful. I love that it's... it's electronica as well as acoustic and i also i just think it's a song that not many people not not a lot of people have heard but once you have this song in your collection it's one of those songs that you'll go to and you'll hurt yourself in a good way absolutely it, it hurts you it touches your heart but it also reflects when you are in love <clears throat> when you are in love um this song speaks to me on that level too it's a, it's just a it's a very beautiful and there's a saying you know a, a good musician knows when to play and a great musician knows when not to and i think this is a, a really graceful piece of music and and a beautiful beautiful lyric and a beautiful melody matt we put together a, a spotify playlist to accompany this podcast so people can go and listen to um all of the records that you've chosen today um and as you know, we're, 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 we're getting into the second half of, of this year and it's, it's a, you know, going to hopefully be a way more joyous and connected um, six months. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you, Matt, like, what are you looking forward to from the rest of this year personally and what's going to be happening professionally? Can I just, uh, just address something you just said? If you, it, I hope it is going to be a joyous year. Yeah. But my, my, my suggestion would be, to have a joyous year, be joyous. And if your neighbor's got a nice motor, knock on his door and say, I just want to say, love your new car. Yeah. And lift people up and wish the best for people and expect the same, same back. It's a much better way to live. And if we just, if we've learned one thing out of this is that we need each other yeah. and we miss each other. And the people that show you love um can can you know you can genuinely you and i can change somebody's day right now and i always say call your strongest friend 
call your strongest friend because they're the people that usually need a phone call because they're the people that people that people assume that they're okay yeah. make a phone call make amends with people if you've got a beef with someone get rid of it but professionally um i've never been more excited about a record I've, I've put my heart and soul into this. I have studied this, you know, sorry. Another phone call came in. Um, I have, that's, 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 that's your strongest mate ringing you, mate. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is actually, yeah, right? it is. Um, this is, you know, this is one of those moments in my life where I'm really proud that I'm still current. I know that I'm current. I know the record's current. I know I've worked with the best people in the industry from Babyface to to Sterling Sound, to, to Jake Bunton and Jay Rust and all these incredible and uh, day by day, you know, you know, it, I'm so, so proud of this record and I'm looking forward to come home and do some, some VIP stuff that we're doing just solely caters to the fans. Uh, it's coming out on vinyl. We're recording 11 videos for this album so that you can actually sit back and watch the album, not just listen to it. Um, I'm going to LA on the 8th um, to do the next single. We've got a five single release. And if it goes well, we're going to do it all 11. And it's, um, I'm just happy to be in the game, my friend. I'm happy to be having conversations like this and talk about music. Um, I'm happy to be talking to people that have, you know, are comfortable in their own space. Um, and I just, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, finding finding more happiness more you know a couple of new mates and, a, and a, you know and sharing the stage again and really keeping it simple not not sweating the small stuff and also always trying to always trying to say i always want to be somebody that will say the word sorry first Matt, it's been such a pleasure talking records with you um in, incredible choices and and yeah it's just been it's been a really lovely hour chatting to you, mate. So thank you so much. You're a legend, mate. And I really love your vibe, mate. And, you you, you know, thank you for what you do and lifting people's spirits. Because I, I I know how hard it is to create content and week after week. And it can be extremely tiring. And anyone listening to your, your podcast, you know, just take a second to acknowledge, you know, the, the, the volume of work it takes for you to do what you do. So thank you, mate. Oh, mate, absolute legend. Matt, thank you so much. Right, much love, bruv. I'm going to just press stop on here, man.